Welcome back to the Center on Buffalo podcast. We're joined this week by the center of the Buffalo Bills, and that's Mitch Morris. Mitch, welcome to the show, brother. Hey, pal. Appreciate you having me on. Hey, you can chug that Red Bull. It's all good. I appreciate you. Nap times in the house are sacred times. No doubt all, about it. For all, including the father. Hey, I, I appreciate you making time for the little people. You crushed it on Pat McAfee last week. So I appreciate you still making time for the little people. No, 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 no. It was, you know what? Uh, it was so much fun. Yeah, I'm just, I'm sure like you, you watch a guy like him. And uh, I remember playing him in 2016 when I was the Chiefs. And our punter, who was a vet at the time, was like, hey, this dude is the real deal. His calling is not even on the football field. So it was just kind of fun to see him explode. Uh, it, was, it was a real treat to be on it. So I was at the Senior Bowl with Pat back in 2009. And I, did you do the Senior Bowl? I got out of it uh, with a finger surgery because they told me they were going to play me at guard. So I, uh, I miraculously still had to recover from a index finger surgery. Okay, so I got two quick surgeries on that. One, I went down there to play center. Never played guard in my life. You know, I played mm -hmm. tight end in high school, tackle my senior year, played tackle my freshman year, my retro year, U L. only played center. Go there, and only in the game did I play guard. And luckily, the guy on the other side was B.J. Raji, who I was training for the combine with. And before the game, he was like, hey, bro, you don't put me down, I don't put you down. And B.J. wrecked the senior bowl that week. So it made me look like a really good guard. Well, then the bills draft me 28th overall and stick me at guard. I'm like, what the heck are we doing here? BJ Raji was a, was a moose dude. What a great, that's a, that's a blast from the past. Well, I, it just scared the hell out of me. So I, I evaded that. And the guy was nice enough, the guy who runs it and he understood. Um, but there was no chance I was going down as a guard dude. Right. And, and I'll get back to my Pat McAfee uh, senior bowl story in a second, but you played in the sec where the, D linemen are all animals. You played in the SEC, right? Was yeah, played three in the SEC, two in the Big 12. Okay, gotcha. Okay, well, the SEC D linemen are a different animal. I, I played in the Big East. Well, I go down there. I'm on the South squad. Well, all these O linemen and D linemen played against each other all week or all year. They had scouting reports on each other. So I'm going to one-on-one -on -one pass rush, and I have no idea who anybody is. I've never seen these guys before. I'm like, oh, this is a different ball game. You guys – so then I'm asking people before the rep, like, trying to do the math. Okay, I'm probably going up against this dude from Georgia. Hey, what, what's he going to – he's going to bull rush me? Is he – He's a pretty yeah. big dude. Is he going to give me a move? Like trying to get some like scouting report stuff, like right before I'm going, I'm like, this is a nightmare, but uh, go ahead. It honestly sounded like a nightmare. It sounded like a nightmare deal. Everyone who went said it, I mean, it was a good experience for guys who wanted to, I mean, I went, I, I trained with Ali Marpet, who was a Hobart guy who, I mean, that, tr that kind of sky rocketed his trajectory in the draft. For me, I just seemed like every, it seemed like my nightmare. Yeah, so in our players' lounge, there was a keg of beer. You, Anyone could grab a beer anytime they wanted, and no one would except Pat. And Pat's walking around with a beer, like, the entire week, and he's like, look, I'm a punter. Like, what What do I have to – I'm a punter and kicker. He was actually a kicker, and he lied to Jim Irsay and told him he, was, he could punt as well, and then he ended up being uh, a really good punter in the league. But he's walking around with a beer the whole week, like, well, I'm not going to try and be someone I'm not. And I'm like, well – uh, good for you. One, I'm just exhausted here. And so a beard, uh, it sounded good, but it didn't sound good for what it would do to me the next day. And then, uh, but dude, that dude was a trip that week and he, he did it the right way. I mean, he interned with Bob and Tom in the morning show and mm -hmm. he did it right. He bet on himself. He got with Barstool and then parlayed that into this monster deal he's got now. So hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. It's, it can be mad, dude. It's a beautiful thing to see. No doubt. All right. So after 19 games plus, you know, you got the preseason games, training camp. How's the body feeling? You know, it's it was a it, it's a good question. It's a double edged sword because you know your joints, your your nervous system, everything feels shot and fried, but there's no. I don't know how you would say it, like acute injury, right? Yeah. There's no specific thing you had to nurse. So in that regard, it's very fortunate. Um, a lot of that's luck, as you know, a lot of it, especially inside where contact injuries and getting rolled into are so prevalent. Um, but also, as you know, Cromer, like he, he's just about getting his work done and not about just grinding you in the dirt just for the hell of it. 
Uh, now, there's a time and place for it, as there always is, but, uh, I mean, he took care of the old guys sometimes, and, and I really appreciate that. And it was kind of a give and take of being a professional, and, um, you know, he trusted me to do my gut job, and, and I trusted him implicitly, and it was a beautiful thing. And also, we were talking about it after the season, just kind of understanding his techniques and having a whole offensive line understanding his scheme. So it's just not a bunch of independent contractors out there throwing each other into legs or – you know, it's easy for a rookie to go out there and just try to smash someone into the ground every play and roll into, well, you guys are great block, but now, you know, Spencer Brown's left knee's blown out. So uh, a lot of luck, but a lot of guys working together. And then I think the chair on top was Cromer helping take care of us. Yeah, Cromer's great. He was my first offensive line coach, and I got – I got to play for a bunch of different O-line coaches, and they all had strengths and weaknesses. But he was the first guy that I ever uh, blocked for that it was more, I don't want to say cerebral, but it was more, uh, he brought a lot of uh, technique, intelligence to the position as opposed to, we're going to be the toughest group, and we're going to go out and bash people and throw them to the ground. We're going to count knockdowns the day after the games. And then all of a sudden, our offensive line stayed a lot healthier when we were blocking (laughs) smarter and we're still tough. We're still moving people off the ball, but it doesn't have to be throw a guy to the ground, which then ends up being a high ankle sprain on one of your buddies. So I always appreciated that about him. How is he in the meeting rooms now? Is he, uh, is he a little calmer with age now? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's hard cause we don't have any perspective, but guys who have been around him before, like, uh, you know, like coaches or personnel in the past say he's definitely calm. You know, he's a grandpa now. Uh, he, I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think he's in a really good spot after that year off. Just, you know, there's no aspirations of being a head coach or a coordinator again. He just wants to have a good room that's got his back. Wants to, he just wants to play good ball with an offensive line that is working together. And uh, I mean, the, you know, everyone's got their time and place. He's going to blow up, um, but it's an emotional sport. But it was few and far between, and he's pretty funny about when his emotions get to him, being the first one to say, oh, that's that. don't worry about it, that's me. Right. Uh, yeah, it's just his deal. And uh, I, I've been – it's just so fortunate where I'm at in my career. I tell him all the time to have a coach like that. Um, you know, you alluded to that when we signed him at first. And you, and you, and you, take, and you, and you take those, you know, those references – but you don't know until you have that experience yourself. And then when you do, all those references make sense. And it's just a beautiful thing. So we, as an offensive line, hold Cromer in very high regards. He has our trust implicitly. And, uh, you know, I think like a guy like Dion also really, I mean, because when you, when you have a relationship, like an individual relationship with guys who, are different to their core, but you know how to speak their language and have their trust and, you know, individually that's rare, but it's also a really cool indicator of not only if it was a coach, but as a dude. Right. Yeah. He's the best. I I, I love him. I, I love that he's back with the organization because especially for night games, we'll, we'll take about an hour and a half during the day and just shoot the breeze. And he's trying to kill time during the day before a night game and we'll just catch up. And I'll oh, always God. love doing that. Love his family. Uh, Huge fan of Aaron Cromer. I know I told you that the second he signed in Buffalo, but huge fan of his and for what he did for me in my career. Right after the season, one of the first questions people are asking you is, is this it for you? Or are you going to keep going? You squash that immediately. What goes into your thought process there? Well, it's it's a two-way street, right? Like, uh, And it's hard to answer that question sometimes when you're in the thick of it. Right. Um and it changes every year with every moment in time. Like, how the hell am I supposed to do this again? Or, uh, you know, when you're in the, when you're closer to the end rather than the beginning, stuff seems to make a lot more sense to you and your family. Um, it's, it's, it's one of those things where if they'll have me back, I'd love to be a Buffalo Bill. But I also understand, as you understand, you were around the game for so long, you understand the business of it, right? Um, so it'll be, it'll just be what happened. Like, we'll see how it goes. And however it is, I told Brandon, however it goes down, like, I don't expect me to mix up my personal feelings with business. Like, I really appreciate your candidness. So when the time comes one way or the other, let's just be, let's just be 
up front with each other. But if it was up to me, uh, I'd love to be back in Buffalo. But I also understand that they're trying to run a business. So we'll see how it goes. And however it goes, it'll be a, a celebration. Yeah. Well, I'll say this from not, I don't work inside the walls. The Bills would be lucky to have you back in. I'd imagine they'll do all they can to make that happen. And, and honestly, to run this entire offensive line back for next year, fewest sacks in the league given up. I know Josh plays a role in that with his mobility, totally. but um, it was also one of the fewest pressure rates in the NFL, if not the least. So that, that goes hand in hand there. It's not all Josh making free runners miss left and right. It's the offensive line as well. Um, looking at this offensive line, you have two new guards this year. How was it? And for those out there that don't know, the center is very reliant on his guards. Like, totally. we need you to – we're helping on double teams and all that, but also they set the depth of the pocket. If you're getting blown totally. up at guard, it screws us. It can make us look really bad. How was it working with uh, McGovern and Torrance this year? Wow. I uh, I just to, – to speak as a whole on the offensive line, it might have been the best group I've been around um, – it was it just like not only were it was kind of a cohesive unit, but we all bought in. And Cromer even alluded to the fact like it was going to take a while to buy into his specific techniques and stuff. And it took a while. It, it even took us this year, guys who've been around a bit, to uh, just kind of fully immerse into that. Um, to speak on the guards, uh, Connor comes from a came from a an area or a team where. He's making first contact like three or four yards deep in the pocket. Like he's getting like three steps back, taking a ball rush to the face. Whereas Cromer is, we're to, we're attacking on the line of scrimmage, right? We're we're as you know. And then Osiris, as a rookie, you just hope you get a guy who, especially drafting the first two rounds, who doesn't think his shit doesn't stink, right? right. Uh, and I, I've said that before. And man, we hit a home run with Osiris in, in that department. Not only is he super strong, he's he just. He soaks up information, and I think the thing that Osiris does that's tough to do as an offensive lineman, especially a young one, is to shake off mistakes and not let that deter you from doing your technique the next time. And he did a great job of that and just being, I mean, when you're in the thick of it and this offense can be so complicated, you know, say last game, we all year we have uh, a protection along with a blitz zero protection built in. In this last game, we understood that they ran so much blitz zero, we flipped all those protections. So we start with our blitz zero protection, and then we went into our regular protection. And he, like, just uh, it's not an easy thing to do. And when the bullets are flying and, and, and stakes are at their highest, and we're doing those, and then we're alerting it. And he's been used to something 100 times this year. He was so in tune with the game plans, even as a young player. Had way more football knowledge than I ever did as a rookie. Right? Uh it's just cool to see. And I think the sky's the limit for him. And, and he's got such a good foundation humbly. And, and uh, it, it, we just worked really well together. We, we and I mean, of course, as an older guy, I did yell at him a little bit. But it was always like, I'm sure you can attest this. On the field, I might be a dick. But when I get to the sideline, I'm going to be your best friend. And the only thing I want to do on the field is make sure we're all on the same page. Right. And, uh, and he did such a good job of that, too. So very spoiled rotten with my guards this year oh that's awesome and it's 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 great to hear he's such a good dude too because he dates uh one of my buddies jordan nora who just got traded to the raptors he dates his younger sister so no uh, no way jordan had vouched for him beforehand was like no he's a really good dude um his agent texted me when he got drafted and said hey will you give him some advice and you know i'm just more hey here's some good restaurants Here's some, totally. here's a realtor whatever you need but mm -hmm. you know you got a good offensive line to go into you talked about you know, the rookies coming in. Imagine having Deion Dawkins. He he was a rookie my last year in the league. We draft him, and he's got this, like, Odell Beckham haircut at the time. Yeah. And he's got all this stuff on social media with the snowman and all this. And by the end of the season, he's literally my best friend. Uh, he was my designated driver as well because he doesn't drink. But yeah, uh, literally, like, one of my best friends, still one of my great friends to this day. And so uh, Dion came in. We expect him to be a backup. Well, then Cordy Glenn gets hurt, and we're like, nope, give us Dion. Just give mm -hmm. us Dion. I love that dude. He plays the right way. We can make it work with Dion. You know, a six foot three left tackle, and Richie's like, no, nah, he's good. Put him in there. Mm -hmm. And he played awesome and obviously has since. So, uh, yeah, but Dion can well, right, well, Dion Dawkins, too. Holy cow. I think, like you alluded, our tackles. I mean, Spencer Brown took that next step. Got a lot of flack from a lot of people, just hunkered down, became like, it was always professional, but 
doubled down on what he knew worked for himself, had a healthy off season. And then Dion is playing at an all pro level, really a, like a, a leader on this offensive line, not only confident in himself, but the guys around him, I, I, if you asked him, like it was, he was, he really vibed with Connor well. And I think that's huge for him. And then, I mean, he was the undisputed, they, I mean, most of the time it was him and Josh as the best players in the field. Right. And sometimes it was him. Like it was just, he played unbelievable football. Our whole run game pretty much for six weeks, like you alluded to, was behind Deion Dawkins. And, uh, you know, it, I understand the all pros and all that stuff can be, it's tough out of Buffalo because it's a smaller market and deal, but, you know, he, he deserves all the credit he got. And uh, it was just a privilege to play with him this year, especially as a guy who I've been around for five years now. Right? Yeah. So we talk about it all the time, very different personalities. Uh, but, you know, there's a, there's a lot of love between us two, and it's just really cool to see him blossom, not only as, you know, Walter Payton Man of the Year nominee, uh, so, you know, so rooted in our, uh, our community, just a cool deal. And he, everything that is positive that's coming his way, he's deserved. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, so you, so you mentioned um, running behind Dion. So a lot of times on the QB sneaks, Josh will take the ball and go left and go behind the left side of the offensive line. I want to know this because I never played in the tush push era. Mm -hmm. How does right. that affect your job as a center when you got someone pushing right behind you, behind the quarterback as well? That's a good question. Uh, it's not as easy for the pusher as you think because you don't want to push too early while the quarterback is trying to catch that snap um, because then you get in a world of hurt. But after that, like for me, now it's just like get the ball to Josh and then understand it's just a, a mosh pit in there. And you drive your feet, but it's hard sometimes because you just – you really just try to explode out of your stance and then hope you don't break something and then – it's a massive humanity on you, as you well know, and you're trying to catch your breath. But uh, that's a good point that I don't think a lot of people understand is that the pusher not only has to understand where the quarterback's going to navigate so he's not just pushing him into a defender, but also make sure that he gets the, quarter, uh, the ball first before he starts pushing. Are you guys practicing that at practice? Uh, I mean – like the, the the exchange we try to do as full speed as possible. Like Cause you center, can't, you can't get a, you can't get a live look at that at practice. Hell People no. are going to get hurt. No, I think the preseason helps. Um, yeah. Guys would get, first of all, would walk off the field. If we started, right. <laughs> we would all walk and say, hell no. Um, but more than anything, it's just the exchange that we work on. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You can't practice that. I, uh, I separated my shoulder twice on QB sneaks and I'm like, look, if we get a guy straight up over my nose, like, sure, run it right behind me on the QB sneak. But when you have the double barrel and the A-gaps, I'm starting to play with my hand between my legs. If you truly think I'm going to get any movement, you're absolutely ridiculous. But this is before the push. So, right. you know, Tyrod Taylor at 205 pounds trying to run right up my back. Neither of us are moving. I'm like, you got to pick a side, T, because I'm just getting Epic. smashed here in the middle. James Cook had an awesome year this year. How much fun is he would block for? Uh, he's a hoot, man. Uh, you know, his personality is so different than the way he runs. His personality is very reserved, uh, mild-mannered, not going to say much. You know, he, uh, he he does have a great personality, but he's just not going to show it unless he's got uh, your trust. Uh, but the way he runs, it's violent, it's explosive. He, and I think he really takes to, you know, Cromer as much as he coaches the, the O-line, coaches the running backs as well sometimes on, like, aiming points, where we're trying to be. Really took that in stride and bailed us out of, like, Josh bails us out of sacks, bailed us out of a lot of bad blocks. Uh, I can speak for myself, uh, especially trying to reach a nose. You know what I mean? Um, he's just great, and I, and I think he deserves all the credit he's gotten and uh, – you know, I think the thing that people don't look at is an eminent tackle for loss. He finds a way to make zero or maybe even a one or two yard gain with the ball. Right. Um, which is hard to do. And, uh, and sometimes schematically it's just like they ran the perfect thing against the perfect play, get yards and at any yard you can and keep the ball in possession. And he does a great job of that. Yeah. I thought he progressed so well this year, his vision, his pace, his timing, and then, 
when it is there to hit it in a moment. And then at times he looks like Le'Veon Bell back there looking for a hole and then hit it. I just thought he developed so well in year two. I've never played, um, it's now Joe Brady's offense, but in Ken Dorsey's offense either. And I never played with Josh Allen. How much responsibility do you get to line of scrimmage or is Josh one of those quarterbacks that's like to handle most of it himself? I would say um, (coughs) that's a good question. It's so dependent on the play and, um, you know, we have a lot of built-in kills in the run game that as the season progressed and we'd had enough time on task that I was able to be like, hey, Josh just killed this, so take a little bit off his plate. But I'm not going to say, like, I'm some center that's reading the defense completely, like, oh, this is a shell, they're trying to hide this. Like, I did it the best I can. I'm, I'm a rules guy. It's my rule in a certain thing. I say what I see, go. Of course, the quarterback's got a trump card because he knows where his hot is, where he's got the picture of it, especially Josh being year six, played a lot of football. Um, I'd say it's probably like a 25-75 split between me and him. Um, but that's a good question. Uh, it just depends on the play. More yeah. often than not. And, I, and, and, and I know what you're saying there. And I think that's a healthy split because, yeah, the center could take some off his plate, but ultimately the quarterback's got to own it. And if he's oh. wrong – and he knows he's wrong. Well, now he can maneuver it or beat it with the throw. If he's totally. wrong, sorry, if you're wrong and he doesn't know it, then you're screwed. So we are uh, problem, I think yeah. that's I think that's a healthy split. What did he get you all for your O-line gift this year? Well, he got us a, a real swanky watch, dude. He got us some Rolexes. And uh, I got to tell you, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, it was, um, you know, Dion really spearheaded the fact that like if Josh didn't quite know what to get us and, and asked us and, and Dion took the reins and said, I think we would like some Rolexes and, and uh, God bless them for it because they are cool as hell. And uh, Josh did not, uh, he splurged for us. And it's one of those things It's one of those keepsakes that, you know, I uh, hopefully give my kids. Yeah. It was really cool. That is cool. Yeah. He was consulting with me the morning of the Philadelphia Eagles game about what to get you guys and so I knew then he already didn't, he didn't have something yet. And so I gave him a few ideas. So maybe next year, um, one of my ideas will come to fruition, which I think you guys will, will greatly enjoy if one of these comes to fruition. I won't spoil one of them. That's uh, fair. I'll spoil one of nah, them. Keep them both, man. Keep them close to the vest. Yeah. Well, I, well I'll just say this. I thought it, I always enjoyed experiences as yeah. much as I enjoy gifts. And so I gave him some ideas for maybe experiences uh, two that involve Kentucky. One is something you would drink and buy a barrel of, and the other one would involve horses. But um, so next year, either of those will be a whole lot of fun and and I can chaperone. So that'd be fun for me as well. Oh, I'm just, just holding my hand. Just bl- I'd be so hammered. Just where are we going? <laughs> exactly. uh, dude, I'm with the horse out of the cage sometimes, they all speaking of which. I, saw, I say, I saw you all got him that four wheeler. Have you ever gotten a quarterback, a gift before? No, uh, we've, we've done it a few years here. We've got Josh, uh, you know, Josh likes wine. So we've got him like a case of his favorite wine and, you know, when you do that a few years in a row, and, and now Josh has got so much wine and, and, and so many wine, it's just he's got a ton of it. And, uh, you know, he's got a little bit of property in the back, and he he bought a little more, so he's got a few acres in his house here. And he's got a side-by-side, but we thought he might just need something to fuck around with. Excuse my language. You can, You're you fine. Can, uh, You're fine. You're yeah, all good. fuck around with. And, uh, I mean, he, he near killed all of us with that thing. And, and uh it was cool. It was just so much fun, and the whole O line was behind it. Um, it was a collab, totally. Kyle Allen was even the one who suggested it, and uh, so it it came as like it was a me spearheading it deal, but not even a little bit. It was a collab uh, that all the guys really enjoyed, and and I, just to see Josh's face on that thing was. It was worth it, dude. Oh, he's a cool. he's a big kid, and seeing his face oh. in the indoor complex riding that thing around, I'm like, one, don't hurt yourself, but two, uh, it was awesome to see him enjoy that. I always joke with Josh about his land that he bought in Buffalo, and I won't spoil where it is, but he found 50 acres that didn't exist uh, on a for sale purpose beforehand. I'm like, 
No, no, they rezoned that area to create a property for Josh Allen, which I'm not hating. Keep that boy around and let him have his pad he wants. But that land was not available at any point that I ever saw. And, and Josh got 50 acres of it. So good for him being able to pull that one off. Sometimes it doesn't suck being him. No. You know I mean? Sometimes it doesn't suck shit being that dude. He he is a, uh, yeah, you're not kidding. Yes. Yes, it was great. It's cool. And it's, it's places, too. It's unbelievable. Yeah, no doubt. Like, no doubt. Hey, have you heard about the pit and the sacrifices to it? <laughs> yeah. I uh, Not only did my wife fill me in, but... You know, we, we sit there, I get there in the locker room well before you're supposed to get there. And I just, you know, I feel like it's an old man deal and you just kind of do your deal. And, and uh, I sit there with our PTs and, and they're always reading the Twitter and they kind of filled me in on the whole thing, which is sociopathic, but it fits right into the Buffalo culture. And it was something that we, we thought, you know, I we were hoping that a police officer would kind of be like, hey, here's a here's a little opening in here and sacrifice a few people. It's a beautiful thing. I just hope no one got seriously injured, a little injury here and there. No big deal. But uh, we, we were familiar with the pit and we were all about it. Oh, it's so funny to me. I mean, Bill's mafia is just an absolute gem. And this just adds to the lore of, of Bill's mafia. Did you see um, Jason Kelsey, another fellow center? Did you see him embracing the mafia? Yeah, I did. I did. And, and it was a beautiful thing to see. He is, uh, you know, like, like I talked before, you know, you were in that, that category of guys that it was an embarrassment of riches when I first got the NFL in the center position, right? It was, uh, it was you, Kelsey, Mac, uh, Pouncey, you know, Ro- Rodney, the Pouncey brothers, Max Unger, all those guys were just, it was really a fun time to be a center in the NFL and have these guys. And, uh, and you watch Jason, and you can't really emulate anything he does. So you just sit there, and you just appreciate what you're saying. And, and then you see how he plays, what he means to the, the organization for the Eagles. And then you see him off the field just be an absolute maniac, and uh, within reason. Right. Right? Um, so it was, it was a fun deal. I just wish he was, you know, it was kind of a bummer, but, you know, I wish he hadn't, like, it wasn't for Trav, who was one of my favorite people of all time as well. Right. You know, it's just hard to see one of your favorite centers of all time rooting against you, but uh, it's part of the gig. But to see, uh, well, to see Travis and Jason, very cool. I, I, I've, I've loved Travis ever since he was my teammate. One of the best teammates you ever be around, too, right? Like guys, he comes. He might. Some people might think he comes off a certain way. Couldn't be a better dude. Couldn't be a better guy in the huddle. Always about his teammates. Just everything that he's gotten. It's just cool to see because he deserves it. And the same as for Jason. It's just kind of fun to see. I know you can allude to this as well, to see him explode into the popularity. But we've all seen from afar and really respect him in the center community, how he plays. But then to see America kind of fall in love with him, it's really cool. Yeah, it is cool. I, I got to know those guys a little bit when they were in college. A bunch of my buddies from Cincinnati went to UC and played with them. So when I'd go back to town, I'd kick it with those guys. So I've always been a fan of those guys. And yeah, it, it sucks that Travis plays on what's become the Bills rival. And, you know, yeah. he's he's torched us. He's torched every team in the NFL on his way to a Hall of Fame tight end career. Maybe yeah. the probably the best pass catching tight end of all time. And, and I don't even think that's that's close. If you want to look all around, maybe Gronk or others compete with him. But I mean, he's he's just an animal out there. He's so I say sneaky athletic, but I don't even think it has to be called sneaky anymore because he's an athlete. He's he's an athlete out there, sure. and he's smart. He played quarterback. He understands coverages, and Mahomes trusts him. And man, they they can put on a show. And it sucks. It's been at our expense and so many other teams yeah. in the AFC. But it is what it is. Um, are you guys doing a no line trip this year? We are, and we're going to do the unconventional route. I think you guys actually might have done this in the past. Dion came back from bye week and gone on a three-day cruise. Of course he did. And, and he was, like, banging his fists, like, this is what we're going to do. And we said, and a lot of us, I'm not going to lie, we're a little apprehensive at first. But I'll tell you what, he did a lot of convincing, and he really pushed it. And we also were able to just kind of put our – apprehension aside and look at it objectively 
and it could be a lot of fun. And I, so I think we're Dion spearheading it right now, and uh, I think we're going to go on a really cool cruise, and it's going to be a fun deal. A few guys not, might not be able to make it because it was a little bit later in the in the off season, um, but I think it's it's going to be a nice change of pace. It's going to be a real fun deal. I wouldn't put Dion in, in charge of that unless he's working with a travel agent or something. But um... yeah, and he, you know, Dion's got a, a a beautiful Rolodex of connections, right? And he and he and he's just a people person, and he's. He's on it with the top of the top. It's really, it's kind of fun to see. Okay, good. Yeah, one year we didn't do a cruise, but we did an all-inclusive down in the Dominican. And, I mean, some of these boys put on a show with the eating <laughs> at this all-inclusive, which most cruises are all-inclusive as well. And yeah. the last night, um, you know, I was our smallest lineman, so it was fun for me to do. But I pulled out the scale and we were talking, you know, we went the week after our season ended. And so we knew what those guys weighed in prior to our last game. Yeah. You have to weigh in every Friday in the NFL. Mm-hmm. And to pull out that scale and to see some of these big boy numbers were awesome. I mean, it was a reality check for some dudes. Oh, dude. And I, I assume this cruise is going to be a moose. We're going to – it's – yeah. So, well, you, you also know that the, the fight to get under the scale – in season for some of these guys is insane. Right. And they do a great job. Um, but it's just to see like the difference between what Thursday morning weigh-ins look like and Sunday during game day. Right. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing how a lot of guys have to cut that weight. Then they put it on and it's just a never ending cycle. One day on the, uh, this will give you guys something to strive for one day of the all inclusive. They, I think we did four or five days. It was, it was, it was long. I mean, it was long mm-hmm. when you're just eating and drinking the entire time. And right. me and Andrew Levitra woke up one morning and everyone was dragging and we were, we got up and we went and sat at the pool bar and you know, nothing sounded that good. So we're like, man, let's just drink light beer, like something we can get down. And we had like six and the bartender was like, man, you guys have had six beers in the last 45 minutes. It's not even noon. And <laughs> either me or Andy said, you think we can drink 25 before five o'clock? And so it became our new thing to drink 25 before five and uh, which leads to a pretty aggressive night, but uh, give you guys something to strive for an explosive diarrhea. Jesus Christ. Dude. <laughs> yeah. oh my God. Draft a light beer in the Caribbean. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, yeah. I don't think it's going to be much different on a cruise ship. We've blown that thing to bits. Right. Oh, great. Buddy, buddy. What's your favorite wing spot in Buffalo? I mean, call me basic, but bar bill is, is just, it's a staple. And uh, I know guys have really attached themselves to wing nuts, which I haven't tried yet. But to be honest, you can do any little like, you know, like a town hall or anything like this, like a little bar. It's going to have good wings. Yep. And that's It's an embarrassment of riches you're going to find it. But I would say if, if I'm going to do wings, which I got to kind of be in the mood to do, I'd say barbell. Yeah. Are you blue cheese or ranch? I'm blue cheese... A sense of um, hesitation. Well, I'm blue cheese because I don't want to be clubbed in the street. No, I respect that. I respect that. Yeah, I took you talk about everywhere having good wings. I took Jason Kelsey to the big tree before the game and got him all set up and then left him with my buddies to chaperone him and his crew. And they were like, Man, these wings are phenomenal. Are these the best wings in town? I'm like, they're really good. I mean, yeah. but every spot in Buffalo has got good wings because otherwise you're going to go out of business and you're not going to be able to serve wings. And so, no hell, no. they're all yeah. going to be Big, good. Big Tree is good though. Big, I, 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 I give it to Big Tree as well. That's pretty good stuff. All right, last one for me. This is a listener question. I thought it was pretty good. What advice would nine-year vet Mitch Morris give to rookie Mitch Morris? Oh wow, that is a good question. Yeah, it was a deep one. Um, that was a deep one. Wow. Uh, I would say. Uh, start wearing elbow braces early in your career for preventative measures because your elbows only have so many punches. The braces or the elbow sleeves? I would say I wore sleeves. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, well, I, I only wore one sleeve. I, I saw a picture of myself my rookie year, and I had like a sneeze worth of tape on my right wrist and uh, an elbow sleeve and like a little bit of tape. And now I'm a... I'm a sponsor of Don Joy. Right. It's remarkable. So I would just say tape up and do the braces and do the wrist rockets more than anything. Holy cow, those are such a game changer. Uh, I would do those earlier so that you're not trying to trying to play catch up after a game every week to get to Sunday. Yeah, that, that's, that's sound advice. 
Hey, brother, I appreciate your time as always. Enjoy the off season. You've earned it. How much time do you take off after after the season before you start training again? Oh, it just depends on what the Holy Spirit tells me to do. <laughs> uh, I would say I, I like to stay fairly active, um, but I like but I like to change it up. Like I'll do a little bit of yoga, maybe some Pilates, swim, do a lot of walking. I, I feel like moving for me, especially as I get older, and you can attest to this. I don't know if I can take total time off, but I'm not going to be working out to make any gains. It'd be just a move. Motion is lotion, right? So I'd say I won't start actually working out, working out until mid-February. Yeah. Yeah. I respect that. It's a long season. I was always the same way. It's like do something because then the body's going to feel good, especially once you get off the anti-inflammatories after the season, the body's going to feel That's terrible so until you start moving. Yeah. And so it's kind of like that. I, I want to lay around, but at the same sense, I know that's not going to be good for me, but Hey, uh, I appreciate you taking time out of uh, the kids' nap time to to pop on the Center on Buffalo podcast. Dude, I appreciate you as always. You do such a fantastic job. Blessings, Bill. Yeah, likewise.